So a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, I want to start off just um, many of you know, there's a lot of new people here or people here a few times you may not know. I'm uh, heading out to Mexico next Wednesday. I'll be gone for a couple of weeks. And uh, every year I go to Mexico and I lead a, um, a retreat um, in a beautiful city in uh, about four hours from Mexico City. And uh, actually, it just made me think to preface this whole talk by saying that talk is just talk. Doing it is what matters. So hopefully my talk will be a bit inspiring. Maybe it will offer you some ideas and some sense of Zen practice, but more important than Zen practice, a little bit of a feel for your own life, for the suffering that you struggle with, and a path towards working with that suffering so that it doesn't hold so much, um, hold you so much in its grasp. Um, ironically, I, when I say it that way, it sounds kind of passive. But on a fundamental level, we all create our own suffering. Life is hard. That's a given. There's difficulty. There's struggle. We don't get everything we want. We're always trying to keep up emotionally, physically. In some, some client of mine this morning, we were talking about death, and we joked that from the moment you're born, you begin to die. Your body starts to go downhill. I suppose the early part of your life, there's a building up of the strength, the ability of your, of your consciousness to function. But from the moment the clock begins, we're heading down towards the end. And Zen, really holds that recognition of death and struggle. And we work with how to work with that, how to hold it in a way that doesn't defeat us and leave it, lead us to more suffering, but actually opens us and allows our life to be rich and full. Those of you who hear me talk a lot, you know, I'm, at some point in the talk, I'm going to say, it's all about being alive, fully present, fully participating in whatever the moment brings. It's a funny thing to say, but I've been noticing lately, a lot of what I do working with people and just for all of us really being in our lives, we have to re rely on our intuition. And we just have to respond. A lot of times we don't have time to do a lot of thinking and planning. We just have to act. Paul said, I'm a psychotherapist and also as a Zen teacher, it's very similar. I meet with people and I don't know what's going to come up. I can prepare in the sense of preparing myself to be present, prepare myself by figuratively clearing my ears out. And I think really what I mean is removing a lot of my own biases, my own belief system, enough to be able to really listen and take in what's happening in the moment, what the person's saying, how they're being. And then I need to respond very quickly without a lot of thought behind it. I just have to, and we say in our Zen practice, I just have to do it. And in many ways over the course of, I've been practicing for 45 odd years. Um, I've been doing the work I do for about 35 of those years. Um, I've been teaching for almost 30 years. So um, I've been doing this a long time and I've grown to rely on my responses. And in many ways, that's practice. We have, we talk some about having faith, and it's not faith 
in something outside of ourselves, ourselves, it's faith in our own nature, our own ability to be present, our own ability to respond from, not from a lot of the knowledge and understanding we have, but from a deeper intuition, a kind of intuition that grows in Zen, in our Zen jargon, we would say, from before thinking mind. My ideas, my opinions, my conditions all create my belief system and my ideas. That belief system and ideas color how I see things and how I respond to things. And to be fully alive, to be fully present, we never really drop those ideas and beliefs, but we can suspend them. We don't have to rely on them so much but we can just be present enough, open enough, and have faith enough in that, what we would call before thinking mind, to be able to just do it, just respond. So a lot of our practice is preparation to be alive, to be present. And the next thing I'm gonna say is a little bit strange, I think, because I think I've been noticing over the last few months that maybe I can't, well, let's, let's put it this way. I'm being, becoming more and more aware of my own mistakes. I have no choice but to trust. I have to do it. But I'm starting to see that I don't always do it right. That I make mistakes, or mistakes are made. <laughs> but there's almost always a chance to come back to it, to recover. I've been in, involved in a disagreement with some people. It's too, too difficult to explain and unnecessary. But I had a, a chance encounter with someone, one of these people. And again, I rely on that ability to really listen and to respond and to be honest and fair. So in our conversation, I made a mistake. In, in some ways, it was a very simple mistake. It wasn't, at first, it didn't even seem like a mistake. She said something that was so offensive to me that I kind of cut her off. And I was like, no, 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 no. But her reaction was as if I had hit her. And I could only imagine what went on for her. So, on one hand, I made a big mistake. But on the other hand, I saw it as it was happening. And I saw that if I just let it go the way it was going, everything was going to be worse. Because I was there, and because... I don't mean to be tooting my own horn in this way, but just to say it clearly, because I was present enough and I could see it, I found a way to recover. First thing I did was apologize. I mean, if you ask me, did I do something terrible? I don't think so. Just if you kept it from my opinion. But clearly, it was offensive to her, and clearly it was gonna set us back. So because I could notice it, I stopped, I apologized, and I kept acknowledging and I kept working with her, I understand. And hear me, I understand you're right, and I'm stopping and I'm listening. And it, the whole thing took about a minute, maybe a little bit less. But in that moment, after the mistake, I could come back, not because I actually, I wanna say this clearly, not for me so much, I could have argued about whether what I did was offensive or not. And I probably had this idea, no, 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 what you said was offensive. But that wasn't gonna get us anywhere. So what I'm really just trying to talk about is the ability to be present enough and what I call alive enough to hear it, to notice it, and respond. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. That's not the point. The point is the presence and that moment of awareness 
and the ability to act on the awareness. So I'm going down to Mexico to lead a, what will end up being about a three-day retreat, plus I'm there a few days meeting with people and giving Dharma talks and things like that. And I, I think all I simply want to say is you have to practice for Zen or Buddhism or really any spiritual idea is a wonderful idea or a psychological idea or a political idea or an emotional idea. It doesn't matter. An idea is wonderful, but unless you make it your own, unless you take it inside and make it part, make it your own, it's all ideas. And ideas help us, but they really don't alter the course of our lives. Even if an idea moves us enough to change everything, it's what we do after the idea that makes a difference. So what I really am just trying to suggest is practice. Actually do it. We spent, we did two short periods of meditation and a little bit of chanting. If we had thrown in a little bit of bowing, and now you're getting a Dharma talk, and many week, uh, Saturdays when I'm on the other side of that wall, I give interviews to people. That's basically our Zen practice. But you have to do it. So we have morning practice here, we have evening practice here, and we have retreats. Retreats are very important because you do it a lot. And there's something very important about the consistency of everyday practice. Even if it's five minutes, take some breaths. Slow your breathing down. Feel your breath, just like Paul suggested in our meditation instruction. Feel your breath in your belly. Slowly on your inhalation, let your belly push out. Slower still on your exhalation, let your belly fall. Allow the rhythm of that diaphragmatic breathing to calm you, settle you, and open you. And just witness. And what happens on retreats, in some ways you might say the longer the better, but even a few periods, things start to shift. It doesn't make any sense logically, but sitting quietly, being with yourself, not thinking about your stuff, although there's plenty of that that goes on during a retreat, but just being with and observing, creating that ability to watch and to have some disbelief for your ideas and opinions and the story that you run, things start to change. Your life can be different. You start to become aware of the ways you get in your own way. When Paul was talking about an object of meditation tonight during meditation, he brought up this great question, what am I? Sometimes I like the, to change it a little, what is I? Where does I come from? Sometimes it's a valuable tool to change I into the third person. So rather than I am hungry, I is hungry. Who's hungry? How do you know you're hungry? What, how much of your hunger is really a need for food and how much of your hunger is desire? Or how much of your hunger is about quelling some other feelings or experiences that you're having that are uncomfortable? In Zen practice, we just ask those questions. And we don't answer them intellectually, we watch. So we train ourselves in this meditation hall to watch. And then practice doesn't end at the walls of this meditation hall. We walk outside and we use that training to watch, to observe how it is we are in our own lives. We notice our responses. 
Maybe we notice our mistakes. Maybe we notice our successes. How did I, what happened there when I was able to catch my error and fix it? To be watching at the exact moment that we're completely living. This isn't a kind of practice where we step back from life, we become tentative, and we watch because we don't want to make a mistake. Zen practice is more like getting thrown into the pool when you don't know how to swim. Every moment of our lives is a little bit like that. We don't know what we're doing. We don't know what's coming next. We're struggling with disappointment, not getting what we want. The boss that's giving us trouble, or this problem, or that problem, and we're, we're bouncing around in all of the struggles and difficulties in our lives. That's not a mistake. Practice means be there. Experience it. Feel it in your body. Notice what it's like to actually be alive. And then respond. Take a risk. Do it. So this took a lot longer than I planned, but I'm trying to encourage you to actually practice. Don't just think about it. If you want this work to make a change in your life, then you have to do it. And I stalled long enough to find the poem. <laughs> so, like I said, it took a little longer. I'll talk probably for another 10 or 15 more minutes and then uh, we'll have some time for a few questions or comments. So this is a poem by um, my teacher, the founder of our school and the Zen Center, that gentleman's picture on the wall, Zen Master Sung San. It's called Original Face. Your true self is always shining and free. Human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. Only without thinking, can you return to your true self? The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming, going. I'll read it again. Your true self is always shining and free. Human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. Only without thinking can you return to your true self. The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming and going. So I want to talk, I want to do a little commentary through the poem. Your true self is always shining and free. Whenever I read this poem, it strikes me that it begins with your basic nature. Your true self is always shining and free. It's always here. Who we are a real self, which we don't even know what it is, but it's always there. Sometimes we think we're so caught up in things that we've lost ourselves completely. You know, so many times I hear people say, I don't even know who I am. I'm so lost in the, in the this's and the that's of my life that I, I can't even find myself. But usually, it takes about a second to feel it, to find it. It's always here. It's never gone. We're already it. Our spontaneity, our ability to hear. You know, sometimes in traditional Zen, they'll say the fact we already can hear, smell, taste, touch, and think. Our true self is just functioning. Zen Master Sung San used to say, Perceiving is your true self. This is not traditional, but the image I get, it's almost like the universe is just energy. And there's just a slight kink, and that's us. A slight little, a slight little twist in the energy of the universe. And somehow, around that little twist, a body can form, and a life begins. And then, the conditioning immediately begins to happen. 
we learn about our culture, our parents teach us how to live, the struggles that our parents have affect us. We start to learn how to, um, to put it a little harshly, to manipulate the universe and people around us in order to get what we want. My nephew had a baby and we were, I thought I heard him say to me that his pediatrician told him that by about three months, the baby starts to figure out how to get what it wants. I, 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 one time I told him he had told me this and he said, I never said that. <laughs> so I thought, well, maybe I made it up. So I went to the internet, I looked it up and actually what I was able to find was six months. Six months it takes till we begin to figure out how to manipulate the universe to get our needs met. And we don't forget. We keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. And in some ways, it's this beautiful thing because we get our needs met as best we can. But taken in another way, we get farther and farther and farther away from that natural, if you will, true self in order to satisfy external situations to get our needs met. And, the con and then it works. So we keep doing it. Our, con our consciousness works by what I think of as confirmation bias. We start to want things and we try things and it works. So we do it again. And we ignore what doesn't work, but we keep go gravitating to what works. And we keep creating what um, in Buddhism we would call a small self. In psychology, you might call a false self in order to live in a world that we don't understand. But Zen points a way back. And, and what I'm saying is, the way back isn't so far. That true self that's always shining and free is here. It's present right now. And all you have to do is turn yourself toward it and it will appear because it's never gone. Your true self is always shining and free. Human beings make something and enter the ocean of suffering. That's what I've just been talking about, about conditioning. We start to find ways, we sell ourselves out in some way in order to get what we need. It's, I'm not suggesting that compromise and working with other people aren't an important part of our lives. But watch out, pay attention to all the subtle ways you abandon yourself in order to get your needs met. Or maybe you're a little bit like me and you're touch conflict averse. So you kind of move away a little bit. It's better to be quiet. It's better to just give them what they want. Then everything will be more harmonious. In some ways that's true, but at what cost? Pay attention. Our practice helps us observe this process. In some ways, this, this is the realm of suffering. Human beings make something and enter, the and enter the ocean of suffering. When Zen Master Sung San says make something, he means wanting, holding, attaching, and checking. We want something, so we sell ourselves out to get it. We suffer. We have something we want, but we're afraid to lose it. We kind of pull everything inward. We get a little greedy. We think we're protecting it, but we end up suffering. Attaching. This is what I want. This is what I want. And the, th the last one is a little more complicated. He calls it checking. I think a more easy way to understand it is self-doubt. I'm not good enough. I can't really do it. I better be quiet. They're not going to like it anyway. I always fuck up. I better not. All the judgment, the criticism, the way we turn it against ourselves. Checking. Am I good enough? Is this right? Should I do it? Am I? All of that kind of stuff. And that's the kind of making that makes up that false self. 
and it creates suffering. The third noble truth in Buddhism says there is a way out of suffering. The fourth noble truth says that is the Eightfold Path, which is a practicing life, which is a life of Buddhist practice. I could list it, but I'd have to read it because I don't remember all of them. But in this poem, he says, only without thinking can you return to your true self. And again, to give that a little bit of clarity, when, when Zen Master Sung San says, without thinking, what he's really saying is non-attachment to your thinking. You're not going to get rid of your thinking. I once gave meditation instruction to a group of about 500 people, and I said, if you think meditation is about not having any thoughts or feelings running through your mind and body, you're going to be disappointed because you're going to see them. And that practice is really about watching them and letting go rather than trying to control. And one, after the meditation, one person raised their hand and she said, I didn't have one thought. I think we meditated for 10 minutes. <laughs> and all I could say was, good for you. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't believe it. But you know, what I've realized is we th people think in different ways. I've begun to ask more and more of my therapy clients how they think, and I'm finding I tend to think in words. I, it almost seems like I'm thinking in sentences or paragraphs. Now really, when I really look at that, I realize that it's, the thought is so fast, it's too fast for a paragraph. Or if I start to tell you what I'm thinking, it takes a lot longer than actually what I, how long it took me to have the thought. But so, many people think in images. One guy said to me, he said, he, he said, all these images, it's like, almost like a deck of cards, one after another. And then, but then one, he'll grab. That one somehow has resonance. And when I look more closely at my process of thinking, I realize that, yeah, if I look deeply enough, there's images underneath. There's a kind of simultaneity of the, the thoughts, the words, and the images. So look deeply. What goes on in your inner process? How is it that your consciousness works? Don't assume it works the same way as somebody sitting next to you. Each one of us is unique. What am I is the question. Not when I was doing research for my master's thesis, I found this Japanese text and the guy said, philosophy is the realm of what is a human being. Zen is the realm of what am I. Each one of us is our own subject. We can watch other people and learn something, but the way we really learn is what? Observing ourselves. Only without thinking can you return to your true self. The high mountain is always blue, white clouds coming and going. As we, as I'm saying this, I realize it sounds linear and it's not so linear. But as we return to our true self, the truth is apparent right now, right in front of us. This floor is brown. That wall is white. You hear the words that I'm speaking, and they're clear to you if you're paying attention. And I don't mean the ideas and concepts, just the words itself. Things are as they are, and if we step, if we can not be attached to our thoughts and feelings. It's actually possible to see more clearly. When I let go of my anger toward that person, I was able to get a better feel for what her experience was. And once I could pick up on her experience, I could find a way to respond. But if I'm wrapped up in my own experience, I barely notice what's going on for you. And I certainly can't be present enough to respond clearly. If I were to change these last lines, I wouldn't say the high mountain is always blue. 
I would just say the high mountain is blue. Always implies permanence. And Zen is premised on impermanence. But what does that mean, the high mountain is always blue? I think in Korea they talk a lot about the Blue Mountain. I live over in Oakland, and I live near Mountain View Cemetery. And that's like my backyard, and I walk there a few two times a week. And as you walk up the hill, you get this amazing view of San Francisco. Mountain View Cemetery, if you haven't been there, I'd really suggest a trip there because it was created by the wealthy families in San Francisco in, the, in 1862. And they wanted to be buried and have this amazing view of their beloved city. And you get this view of San Francisco that's unobstructed and it's, you can see all the bridges, it's amazing. But it's about 15 miles from the hills over to San Francisco. And as you look at San Francisco, it's always blue. It's as if it's a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. It always has a blue tint. And any time I go up there and try to take a photograph of it, it's worthless. Because this blue tint covers the whole thing. So it's weird to say the mountain is blue. But if you look at a mountain from a distance, it is blue. White clouds coming and going. The mountains and the cloud have a relationship. Clouds form around mountains. And rain comes from clouds. Without the rain, the mountain would be barren. But because of the rain, the mountain is fertile. And not only the rain, but the lightning that comes from the cloud actually splits off nitrogen in the atmosphere. And the rain brings it to the ground. So that what might be inert soil gets organic nutrients of, of nitrogen and plants can grow. In that one process, we see the interdependency of this whole world. Nothing exists in this universe separate from everything else. That's the big secret. That's why when we read articles about the mass extinction of animals and plants that, that might be coming, it's so alarming. Because you pull out big pieces of the ecosystem and the ecosystem is, is changed. Everything is needed. Even the things we don't like. Without them, our whole life falls apart. So there's a kind of radical acceptance that comes out of this practice. Even if I don't like it, I can recognize the importance of it and the need for it. And if I could just say one more thing, somebody pointed out when I read this poem once that white clouds coming and going can also be looked at as our thoughts. The mountain is there. The thoughts come and go. And when the thoughts are thick, we can't see the mountain. Doesn't mean the mountain's not there. It's just that we're so full of our own stuff that we can't see it. But the clouds are coming and going. And in a moment, the clouds disappear and the mountain is there. Our true self is always shining and free. Allow the clouds to part, and it's already here. You don't have to create it. You don't have to make it. You don't have to manufacture it. It's already here, already alive. Participate, express yourself, and pay attention to the results. Thank you very much.